Guys Show. Guys, this evening, we are going to be talking with you about the Project 2025, uh, which is also called uh, Agenda 47 or 180. And this evening we have with us, and, and this gentleman will have to be leaving uh, real soon, but uh, he, he's one of our, our panel members and, and our, uh, our process, I, I call them, I'll call them all process thinkers, is uh, Brother Pendleton. Brother Pendleton, will you introduce yourself, please, sir? Okay, yes, I'm yes, Charles I'm Pendleton from Vicksburg, Mississippi, and I'm the owner of the Vicksburg Civil War Museum. We want to thank you, Brother Pendleton, for being here. We want to encourage you guys uh, to be sure to support that. Brother Pendleton, while we're waiting on our other panelists, uh, would, would you mind? I know you have to go in quick and in a hurry. Would you mind sharing with them how they might uh, be able to visit your facility? Yes, we're located at 1123 Washington Street here in Vicksburg. It's right, I mean, downtown Vicksburg. Uh, it's so far, it's been rated the number one museum in Vicksburg and surrounding areas. It's actually uh, pretty easy to find. Uh, we deal with the Civil War from a different perspective than uh, the typical Southern Civil War Museum. So I think it would be a treat for anybody to come and check it out. Uh, my and name is... Uh, yeah, my name is my name is Robert Graham. Um, I'm overallly just interested in being a sponge as from elders above me um, to continue to move this ball forward towards revolution type situation, you know, like learning, learning, learning information so that we know the tools um, to implement our next plans of action. Um, I think part of our issue now is we kind of we kind of lose track of the progress that has already been made and that we kind of miss the the human p impact of individuals that have made it has it's not always the the big names that make it to the top of the marquee to ultimately make the show happen so want to be one of yeah so I, i'm i'm just i'm just appreciate being here as as, as we know there's been a, a lot of talk about project 25 or agenda 47 or 180 etc and as we know as it, it, most people, if not all, it, we have older individuals, and one of the first things on there is talking about privatizing our Social Security. And I, I'm not a Social Security expert by any stretch of the imagination. However, uh, I do know that most individuals, regardless of race, creed, or color, uh, depend on it in some way, shape, form, or fashion, whether it is there and whether it's the entirety of their retirement plan, uh, whether it supplements their retirement plan, or whether they have uh, loved ones that are in need of Social Security, et cetera. So when we talk about this process of uh, Project 2025 and people are trying to pretend, uh, you know, uh, let me, may I back up a moment? Some people even trying to pretend, oh, well, it's just all a hoax and it's not real. Well, uh, there are videos out all over the internet uh, that will show you where these individuals are actually going through trainings uh, to be able to implement this. And if you're in Louisiana, you see the Louisiana governor, uh, Landry, who's already trying to implement a lot of this stuff uh, in, in our state. Then you have Georgia uh, have the nerve uh, to try to, and that override vote, people's voting rights and talking about they can hold up votes and this, that, and the third, and they pass this uh, legislation about uh, not certifying the votes immediately and all this kind of stuff. And they're just people on on the board, and they don't even have the, the lawful act to do so. And of course, they're being sued. So as we talk about Project 2025, then we have to open our eyes to what's really going on. And it's about human beings. That is the caveat that, that we want to address tonight, is that this is about human beings. It's not about black and white. It's not about brown, et cetera. So when, just, just something as, as when we talk about uh, the privatization of Social Security. And then privatize veterans' health care. I mean, who would even come up with with with, with something like that? Privatizing veterans' health care when all we preach in these Americas is about being uh, uh, patriots and and honoring uh, our veterans. And 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 on a personal note, I'm going to say this for my audience and for you guys. I tell people all the time: that's an insult uh, just to say to someone, uh, "Thank you for your service." What is that? 
<laughs> you know, I'm being very honest. There's so much more we can do, so much more we can say when we look at veteran suicides that are happening, I think, at the rate of 25 per day, uh, homelessness, all of this kind of thing just among the veterans. And all we can say to them is thank you for your service. And then you have Congress, uh, many of the Congress people and the Senate that will not pass measures to help our veterans and that kind of thing. So again, this Project 2025, uh, this Agenda 47 and 180, that you want to call it, is truly and clearly not a document that any of us uh, should be embracing. But sadly, the Donald J. Trump regime is right in the middle of this, along with Donald J. J. Trump and his chosen person to run as vice president. Would you like to share with us, uh, Brother Robert, what, what your ideas may be about the first two things we, we've discussed? Um, yeah, most definitely. Um, I've been I've been looking into the Project 2025 since our last meeting. Um, I've looked into it a little bit more and I've listened to, um, I guess, more expertal opinions of it because it is a 900 page document in a, in a, in a field that is not necessarily my, my parte. Um, but what I have um, learned and, and understand is that it's it's a it's not just this is just the most recent version of this attempt that they've been attempting to do since honestly like the 1960s. Um, and so the the project 2025 um, has become a nice kind of catch all phrase that piques people's attention. But it's one of those things where this is the same people that came up with the Southern strategy. And so this isn't something that we can take on as a surprise, but also we can't underestimate it as something that they've only been trying to do since Donald Trump was president. Like this was something that they've been attempting to do since Richard Nixon was president, since the signing of the civil rights bills. So as someone who was not uh, um, who's only reaped the benefits of the civil rights movement, not necessarily witnessed or lived the struggle in the middle of it. I came in on the back end, but to know that A, that was only a generation ago, and then B, they weren't happy then, and we know how American history goes. If they're not happy, they're not going to just lie down and say, oh, you're right, you got us, you know, that's actually morally wrong. No, they're going to rally themselves up just like in Reconstruction, and then they're going to come up with something equivalent to the Ku Klux Klan to fight whatever they think is not the progression that they want to see moving forward. And so it's just something that we just have to kind of know that it's not a, a five year, it's not it's not something that started in 20, 2016, like this has been going on for almost a century. So view it, view it through that lens, and it's a lot less surprising is the way that I kind of look at it. And Brother Graham, let me say, you are absolutely right. And again, please allow me to express that's the sad part. And why we're even having uh, this forum right now is because people try to act as if it's something new and it's something that just hit the horizon and you hit the nail on the head, even way back uh, during the civil rights movement and those kinds of things. And, and just to move, uh, move along a little further, uh, you know, when we talk about privatizing the infrastructure projects. I mean, everything you see is talking about privatizing. So it tells you right from the beginning that is greed that's driving this whole process. It is not about people. And let's say, dare I say, of the American people. It is not about what is best for our country. It is about what's best for the lining of the pockets of all of these individuals who have been upset uh, pre-Civil War, during the Civil War, and post civil war because they cannot and privatize the federal aviation administration everything that that we're reading and we're seeing in this 900 page document is all about selfishness and all about making money for the few and again not addressing the american people that reduce federal disaster relief programs who in their right minds would even think about as and you live in texas I live in Louisiana. California have earthquakes in other places. So you want to reduce federal relief programs because in Louisiana and Texas with all these uh, hurricanes and, 
and the California with the earthquakes and the, all these serious thunderstorms, and we're talking about global warming. And, yeah, and, and that's, that's please. And I, I I apologize, but that's something as someone who is on the generation that's going to have to deal with the the post from the industrial revolution revolution resolution of what we have done to the planet as a whole. Like the planet before the 1920s had natural resources that were just abound. And in the past 100 plus years, we have used said natural resources for personal gain, so to speak. But there's a cost that takes on the planet that, that it comes to. You know, like trees have a purpose. Um, oil was in the ground for a reason. Um, gold and natural minerals were in the planet like for a reason. And if we continue to use these natural resources for purposes of you know driving our cars electricity in our houses making makeup plastic bags cars and stuff like that um there's just a toll that's taken on the planet and very much like what you said where it's like a all of the the big natural disasters that we know of are in areas that to a degree have a, a certain level of natural disasters you know what i'm saying like if you're in louisiana if you're in houston if you're in the coastal part of texas you expect some sort of hurricane activity during the season change just because the way the world works and temperatures and stuff like that but what we're experiencing now is a heightened level and we and we can statistically see this and instead of preparing ourselves for the reality that you know okay we've known since honestly the 1990s that hurricanes are getting more frequent more disastrous so why don't we prepare ourselves for this known conclusion instead of putting departments so that some somebody on the side can get can make a little bit of more millions even though they already have millions where it's like you know in, invest in the growth of your country is is the the narrow sightedness i think that um these cutting departments don't realize you got to invest in the future otherwise there will be no future well very very well said you know and that's the whole premise again i'll repeat that's the premise of us having this this conversation tonight because of the thing that that you're sharing and you know when we when we talk about reduce funding for federal research programs so if you don't have research i mean and and, and brother graham i know you know this and i know our audience knows this uh everything so education everybody talks about research 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 so how are you going to be able you know i mean well let me backtrack myself even the census is nothing but research to, to see how many uh, people are, quote, uh, on, on the soils, uh, what is going to be needed as far as, and they're talking about reducing uh, monies for infrastructure, and they're talking about reducing monies, uh, excuse me, for federal disasters and all of that kind of thing. So then now you come up with about reducing funding for federal research. So quite honestly, uh, you will know nothing, just like sadly, I'll say it, uh, they know nothing like they know nothing now. And they're trying to push this agenda on America. And you talk about decreased regulation in healthcare. We all are aware of massive illnesses and we won't even get started uh, talking about the crisis in Flint, Michigan with the water being poisoned and the kids having problems with lead poisoning, even right here in, in, in Louisiana and Shreveport, et cetera, uh, problems with the water. You look in Jackson, Mississippi, where they were having issues and, and you had the government there uh, withholding funds and not doing things uh, because of uh, racist attitudes, et cetera. So we can clearly see who the proponents are behind writing documents like this, uh, reduce funding for public health programs, repeal the Affordable Care Act, promote free market health care. What exactly does that mean? So as we're talking about this, uh, Brother Graham, as we don't have the panelists, and uh, as I said, we're not going to hold up the hold, hold up the the eye opener. That, that that's what I'm calling it, the eye opener tonight for our general public. Uh, our other panelists will be on, and maybe they'll catch us next time. So yeah, must have. <laughs> and I appreciate I appreciate what you were just talking about uh, with the uh, the known water issues between Flint and Mississippi, and it's like that also kind of ties into my my previous thing, where it's like a the the water issue in Michigan is a lot because of the industrial automobile industry from the early, early part of the 20th century. 
And instead of knowing that, okay, we're, we're putting a lot of, we're using a lot of machines around these nat natural water resources, we're going to eventually have to clean these up. They just move and relocate. And then we end up having to stay or moving into those areas because they're affordable living, not knowing about the, you know, the natural disasters around them. Absolutely. And sadly, sadly, these individuals that's, that are the authors of this are not concerned. And when we have, and this is, we we're not uh, talking about a po political show tonight. However, the item that we're talking about is political. And you have all these individuals still running around talking about, oh, the economy is this and the world is so bad, et cetera. But you have people living in million dollar houses, driving $500,000 cars, uh, vacationing, uh, going on cruises, the whole nine. But America is in such terrible shape and the economy is so bad and all of this kind of foolishness. You wanna, because that's all you wanna, it is you, gaslighting. You want to do a scary thing? I, I went down this wormhole and I looked at how much certain companies spend on advertising because you know you can kind of see the same commercials over and over and over again when you're watching just a regular program you see the same commercial over and over again and i looked into companies like state farm wendy's burger king you know commercials that you see on a continual loop did you know that state farms spends over a billion dollars in advertising a year burger king spends over 500 million dollars on advertising a year where I'm like, I'm like, I'm I'm dealing with State Farm now because I'm trying to get um some payment because of a storm that happened in in uh in the end of May. They don't want to give me a proper payout for my loss of personal items. I had renters insurance, pay my renters insurance bill. But they're spending a billion dollars in advertising. Just imagine if that billion dollars that they're spending in advertising they actually spent towards claims. Or, you know, Burger King is spending $50 million in advertising. Imagine if they spent that $50 million or $500 million on fighting hunger. You know, like there wouldn't be any hungry people in the street. You're a restaurant. Instead of spending money on advertising, you could be feeding people who don't have food. But that's just a, you know, it's a, the resources are there. It's kind of to what your point, the resources are there. It's just where we choose to allocate them. Absolutely. And and that sadly is 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 what we are discussing. You know, is and when I say we, I'm talking about uh during this political season. I mean, I have to say that is what people are uh, they keep talking about uh, you know, <laughs> their values and and all of this, all of this about uh, you know, uh uh the the I agree with uh the the what word am I searching for here? Uh to make a loan, I cannot. I said I was going to put this in layman terms tonight. So they are agreeing with all of this garbage that we're talking about now, and and not even wise enough to understand that the garbage that we're talking in. I'm calling it garbage because that's what it is. Is, is that it affects them, but they are so busy uh, trying to pretend not to be racist when all of this is not only racist, but it's against everybody. So technically, you can't call it racist because it affects the same people that's trying to support it, which to me that's been a, is insane. Yeah, that's been, that's been a, a tool that they have found a way to use miraculously is to not, a, not appear to the poor whites, so to speak, as if the racist policies are actually harming them as well. You know, where it's like, a, and I was reading up on uh, Nathan's Rebellion in the, like the early 1700s, late 1600s, is kind of the spark of where um, white uh, European born indentured servants did have a time where they, they felt a companionship with the, uh, with the work labor, with the black workers. But then they found out that if, if both the European uh, servants and the African servants realized that we're not fighting against each other, we're actually fighting against the landowner, they found a way to get those two parties to, to buck against each other instead of working with each other. And that's that classic divide and conquer tactic. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, as, as you may recall in your reading, 
Now, your former president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, said, said it best, and I quote, he said, you could take the lowest of the white man and make him feel uh, that he's better than the black man and he will empty his pockets for you. And that quote has never been more true to this very day because I, re I repeat again, is it a racist policy that they're trying to push through? Of course. However, it's an oxymoron in that it is racist, but it's also anti-humanitarian because you are, and you've said it well, when you talk about the information that you just read. So you are affecting not only poor, uh, quote, white people, unquote, you are also affecting the middle class white people as well. And and, and Brother Robert, I, I usually call my, my white people my less melanated brothers and sisters because I do that out of respect for all of us because we've allowed uh, people to label us as being uh, a certain race when we all know that is only the human race. But so uh, I, I say that non sarcastically when I call them my less melanated sisters and brothers. So uh, as we, I apologize for that. Yeah, I apologize for that. No, 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 no. There's nothing for you to apologize for. I, I was just clarifying uh, to our listeners who who are here for the first time, and we have quite a few that's here for the first time. Is that when I when I refer to the less melanated sisters and brothers, that's what I'm talking about because I too, on many occasions, will say white. So don't don't you, there's nothing for you to apologize for. So, but I'm just clearing that up for our listening audience as we just move forward yeah. here to help help them understand here when it talks about dismantle the Department of Education. I mean, what sane person would talk about dismantling the Department of Education, no matter how much people talk about, oh, the education system is broken and, and some of the schools are doing so poorly and the this and the that and the this and the that. Well, take it from a former educator and, a, and dare I say a successful one at that. Uh, we have many, 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 many schools that are very productive, that are non-parochial, that are non-private, that people simply try to ignore. You have the George McKenna's, who of course is still alive and with us. I have not seen one administration, not one, consult Dr. George McKenna. Well, you don't get a movie unless you're successful. I haven't seen not one administration, even though Mr. Clark has passed on now, consult Mr. Joe Clark. But everybody likes to talk about the, the uh, how dismal public education is. Both of these gentlemen, and there are many more that I don't, uh, I won't call their names right now, uh, that have been successful in public, excuse me, uh, education. And, and dare I say, with no shame, I am one of them. And I know many people that were and are right now. So again, you know, that's, that's a dog whistle for, we want to privatize the schools so we can hand pick and hand select what students we want. We want to privatize the schools so that we can continue to pad our pockets. We want to privatize the schools so that we can pick uh, specific places for our people to work. And the kids that are struggling, we don't have to take onus in the fact that we are not servicing them the way they should and, and we are not promoting their growth, whereby uh, they're only good enough to be hand servants, uh, to be people that are incarcerated, et cetera. See, that's the silent dog whistle. And sadly, you have so many people that are disenfranchised, regardless of race, creed, or color, that actually fall for that. And dare I mention, uh, brother, people are still asleep. They're still asleep about the Segregation Act being passed and all that stuff. That was because they wanted access to star black athletes. All you have mm -hmm. to do, all people have to do is open their eyes and look around and see what's happening. They wanted ready access to star African-American athletes. And dare I say, uh, in his uh, sleep, Bear Bryant, after being smacked and whipped by USC, uh, made it very clear. He said, we got to get us some of them. Whether them he was talking about was people mm -hmm. like Sam Bam Cunningham and these other star mm -hmm. black athletes. So yeah. people, black people need to wake up. This thing is and about I'll... having access to athletes. They don't give a bleep whether you and I get educated or not. And I'll, and I'll I guess, piggyback off of two points that you made. One of the things that like really kind of shocked me 
is uh, when Malcolm X was talking about the desegregating of schools, like kind of how I mentioned earlier, this isn't a project that's new. Like these, the, these are just, they're still fighting, fighting the same fight that they didn't like during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. It's just changed its face, but the spirit remains the same. Uh, Malcolm X was talking about how we shouldn't be celebrating that it took the National Guard to allow students, for to allow children to go to school. And then also, if we if we if we remove ourselves from that's our country, that's our history. If you just look at that image as just an image, like let's say for and, and you see a a child walking into a school and adults screaming, berating, throwing things at that child who wants to go to school. Like I we can't you you can't you can't become progress as a nation if that's how you're treating education you know like if you think like and it's it it kind of ties into the like they're really still upset that the federal government told them that they had to get rid of slaves um and it's been it's 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 been a yes. fight from then where it's like that's why they don't like big government because big government is the one that told them that they had to get rid of slaves that they had to integrate the the classrooms that they had to give equal rights to to all citizens of the nation those were not state wins like those were federal wins like the federal government had to get involved for these changes to happen because they wouldn't have happened at the state and local level you're absolutely right Brother Graham, and that's where, again, and, and I just have to say it, where, where I, I really have had, and I'm going to use this colloquial term, I really have had my belly full of these, and I'll call them so-called, so-called black conservatives. What in the heck do you think you are conserving and all these so-called MAGA people for Trump? What, 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 where have they been living? What history have they been reading? Who are their ancestors? What are they not seeing that we see on the news every day? What are they not seeing in housing discrimination? What are they not seeing when you see information all the time about soldiers that returning from World War II were snatched off the bus and hung, uh, not given full, uh, 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 what am I looking, what, what am I looking for? Uh, not giving full access uh, to the GI Bill. I mean, all of these things, that have yeah. transpired, and we have people that look like you and I talking about uh, they support Trump. This, that, and this, and the third. We, and, yeah, uh, we know uh, the, I'll, yeah, we know the saying. All what is it? Uh, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Absolutely. And and that's and that, I think that's kind of what it what it falls under, and it's one of those things where as I look into uh, the history of black cowboys, um, in the in the wild wild west. You're you 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 reminded that there were black soldiers that fought for the Confederacy because of personal gains. It was more it was personally more for me to be tied in with this person, even though they are a slaveholder, than it is for me to consider myself nationally as an African American. And like unfortunately, like there's still people that have that individualistic mindset versus the collective which unfortunately that is a human trait it's not a you know and when we just when that's that's one of the look at ourselves as human beings and not as a you know a collective like a, a, a group of people you know like there are humans black white yellow that will will shoot themselves or would not shoot themselves but that will look out for themselves individually versus the collective and i think that's where the the black conservatives kind of lean towards a lot of them because I I went through barber school and had one of those and uh, a a lot of a lot of them look at it as an individualistic I'm a small business owner like such and such taxes affect me personally um, I'm not trying to give out any handouts nationally when it's like they're not realizing that like what you're considering a handout we used to consider a help your neighbor you know where we consider taxes, where it's like, a, okay, yes, you don't want to pay taxes, but if those taxes 
go to make sure your kids have food in the in the in the cafeteria make sure that the the roads are fixed make sure that you have public transportation for overall citizens those those are what taxes are intended to do but like people don't connect the the your tax is going towards public service they think that it's the government stealing money from you well put to that point brother graham i'm so glad that that you mentioned that because we i, I won't get to your cowboy statement here but i have to say as you shared about the taxes uh but but those same individuals have no problem with these billionaires not paying taxes those same individuals have no problem that when they are pulled over by the cop now you want to run to the naacp and everybody else and talk about how you just you were discriminated those same individuals have no problem when they're walking around in a, a random store being followed those same individuals have no problems when they're in the mall and then they may be talking to two or three people and and now you are a crowd gathered together and you have uh all of a sudden mall security showing up and hanging around those same individuals have no problem uh, when we talk about quotas and you don't get to advance your barbershop and grow other barbershops because you cannot obtain a loan those same individuals have no problem when they are making money off of those same individuals that they do not want to share with. So it becomes an ugly trope of human beings, uh, especially when we've been uh, downtrodden and disenfranchised. And that's why I said earlier is that too many times, yes, are things racist? Of course, but sadly, uh, they are humanistically inept because we hurt people be regardless of the color of their skin. And many times people try to hide behind the fact, oh, they're always trying to play the black card. Well, the bottom line is we did not write the history. So, and, and that's why I want to segue uh, into your statement about cowboys. Tell people all the time, Brother Graham, all you got to do is watch the Westerns. I said, everything you see, gunfighters are glamorized, stagecoach people are glamorized, bank robbers are glamorized, as even in modern times, Bunny and Clyde are glamorized, but you never saw Black people doing any of the crimes. So how is it that all of a sudden we are the uncivilized, savage ones? Whenever you watch the wagon trains and stuff moving across the West, the Indians are the ones that are the savages, but you took their land. You didn't come in and try to sit down and talk with them. You broke the treaties. You murdered all of the buffaloes and things of that nature. But the Indians are the savages. So these are things that, as we uh, further discuss Project 25, and when you have people talk about make America great again, that these same guys that I'm talking about, I haven't lost my thought that all these so-called Black conservatives, I'm not talking about you, homeboy, <laughs> because you talk about uh, you don't want to pay 15 more dollars in taxes or 30 more dollars in taxes. They are including you when they're talking about make America great again so that you cannot open up that barbershop so that you cannot have a Black Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the things that we talk about holistically uh, as we address Project 45, uh, when you talk about the, the 20 or 25 major massacres that we know that have gone right here in America uh, because someone allegedly committed a crime. So you go in and you burn down the whole town. You murder women and children, et cetera. And the the the, uh, the OSAP that I think I'm correct correctly, and everybody knows about Black Wall Street. But and I had planned to put it up uh, uh, tonight, but I decided not to because that'll be another show. But all of these places where all of these massacres occurred, you know, uh, Rosewood and all of these places. So when I and that's why I had to address our and that's why I call them our so-called uh, conservative black people. What are you conserving? <laughs> what are you conserving? So it lends to things like Project 2025, it lends to this so-called Black Trump supporters when I'm looking at this sheet and I'm seeing increased private sector role in public education. What private sector role in public education? You can't even control private education. Why do I say that, Brother Graham and, and my listeners? It's because if you look right now across the country, I need them to name people that have made significant contributions to this America that went to Yale, that went to Harvard, uh, that went to these 
the so-called Ivy League schools and that type thing, when it comes to all of the inventions and things that were made, even something that we love as much like what we're doing right now on this internet, black people, cell phones, black people. I mean, you, it goes on and on and on and on. And these people were, were educated, those that were educated, were educated at your what we call the HBCUs, et cetera. So I say holistically, as I, as I spread this brush, as we talk about this foolishness that's called Project uh, 2025, that's called Agenda 47, that's called 180, it's nothing but selfishness among those individuals who hold this hatred in their bodies, who uh, conveniently dismiss something they pretend they believe in, like the Bible. Says God has no respect for a person that he made man in his own image. Uh, treat your neighbor as yourself. I mean, those three little simple things right there dismantle all of this craziness and all of this hatred that we live with day to day. So now we're sitting up here discussing a so-called, and I call it so-called, even though it's very real, a Project 2025 20, and Agenda 47 on 180. And we look further, yeah. uh, Brother Graham. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, honestly. Okay, there we go. I'm sorry. Um. No, it was, a, it was a temporary little glitch. Um, but one of the things, because uh, I'm, I'm one of my lifelong things is I don't want to. I just want to be a positive change in the world. So I'm looking into uh, how revolutions do come across. How do how do people who are on the bottom end of society and culture make themselves to the middle and work their way up? Um, one of the secret weapons that I do think that um, as our generations of of melanated people. Uh, integrate themselves into society um or what we consider like the public domain we're we're losing our our collective energy that we had when we were not as prosperous uh one of the things that um yes. if you if you if you run into a, a to an old head that doesn't necessarily think that integration was the best movement for us they will say that at least in segregated times your community all looked like you and there were multiple levels of what that was for you like there were black doctors black lawyers black uh bankers black newspapers um so there wasn't like this some people didn't even experience the segregation part of it because their world was so small we live in a in a big world where we kind of see it more but we're missing the that collective energy of your neighborhood was 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 uh boundless in power you know the the local small church black church the members might not have been very large but every one of those members was a part of the community whether it was like you know like might have been your teacher might have been your your hairstylist might have been your banker might have been your lawyer might have been your dentist and y'all go to church together so that community was something that tying into your uh, your black conservatives mantra, where it's like they may not necessarily view themselves as part of the community. And so these individual tactics that they're doing for themselves makes themselves feel a part of a community, which that's a that's a that's a tool that that Mr. Trump does have is he has this weird ability of making people feel like he's a part of them, even though he is absolutely not. Very, very well said, Brother Graham. Uh, I'm reduced federal student aid. Okay, so who does that affect? We already know uh, people that, uh, again, it may come across as, you know, as people of color, we'll say that's racist, but you have so many people that are not of color that need uh, federal aid to, to further their education and that kind of thing. And so that that's why we continue to say is that the very people that's voting for, many of them that voted for Donald Trump is voting against their own interests. Uh, excuse me, cut federal support for renewable energy projects, reduce regulations by the Environment Protection Agency. And the list goes on, Brother Graham. I'm going to uh, run down a few more here. Uh, withdraw from international climate agreement. Why? Uh, reduce environmental regulations on businesses. Why? Promote energy production on federal band, lands. Why? Uh, limit the jurisdiction of federal courts. So why are you trying to limit jurisdiction of the courts? Because you don't want them to go after the criminals that that you help coddle, uh, decrease the size of the federal workforce. Also, now you're trying to fire people. 
but but you're saying you're going to uh, develop jobs and increase jobs and take care of people, uh, restructure the Department of Homeland Security. Why do you want to do that? Uh, because you're not happy because they're not running around murdering and hanging people. Reform the Department of Justice. Why are you doing that? Uh, so that you can create a, a bigger Ku Klux Klan uh, and bigger uh, militia program uh, like your your uh, Donald Trump has already said. What he'd do is he would give all police officers uh, absolute immunity, which they operate on the right now. Uh, we're saying that if I'm a police officer and, and if, if I'm a Klansman or if I'm sympathetic with them or or if, if I'm a vigilante or whatever, and I decide I want to go out and 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 uh, kill you, uh, Brother Graham, I'm good. Because all I can say is I was doing my job, even though everything indicates and shows that I'm guilty of murder. When we talk about repeal Dodd-Frank financial regulations, when it talks about helping individuals uh, build businesses, is that a policy Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? Why? Uh, repeat net neutrality regulations. Why are we trying to do away with regulations? Because it brings about fairness. Limit federal involvement in local uh, policing. Why would you want to elim eliminate that? Because now you can't stock your police uh, our departments with, with Klansmen and, and militia people and all of that that would go around again uh, trying to intimidate, terrorize, and murder. Uh, eliminate the Department of Commerce. Why would you do that? Because now the ultra-rich and, and those that are, are close to them uh, can continue to monopolize everything. Limit federal environment and local policing. I said that. I reduce federal oversight of labor standards. Why is that? So now I can just, uh, I don't have to hire the best qualified applicant. Uh, I can destroy unions and the whole nine. Uh, implement a flat tax system. Why would I implement a flat tax system when I already know that people are in different tax brackets according to their income? So now I have Robert, who's a chef, uh, who may uh, be making six figures or less, et cetera, but his taxes are going to be the same as somebody making $500,000 a year. Uh, and, and I'm just being modest uh, with that. Lower carpet tax rates. Why are you lowering carpet tax rates? Uh, well, you just finished saying that uh, uh, State Farm and Burger King and the amount of money that they spend just on advertising. So you want to lower their tax rates. Restrict the powers of the Federal Reserve. Oh, so now when we talk about money and producing money, now you can just monopolize that as well. So, you know, Brother Graham, as, as we get ready to close this thing down tonight, I didn't want to oversaturate people. That's why uh, I and I, it might have been a bad decision. I see I still see th hands going up. They want to ask questions and I, I'm appealing to them to let us do that on, on the next show. And, and we will revisit all these things we're talking about tonight. But I just wanted us to get through the initial phase of talking about uh, openly uh, 2025, uh, this 40, this this. Uh, 47 and 180, et cetera. So, Brother Graham, uh, with all of that stated, anything else you'd you like to share and address uh, a bit before? Um, I would like just to say, honestly, like overall, um, Project 2025 has become, I, I appreciate that everyone is ears up and attuned to it, knowing that of what it's capable of and our ability to see what they are actually planning. Um, one of the things that the Lord has to remind me is that it might it might seem pretty dark now, but remember where I have already been and what I have already pulled people out of. And, and this right now is honestly a blessing because there was a time when even if you say 30, 40 years ago, Project 2025 would have only been released amongst a small group of people and they would have known all about it and we wouldn't know anything about it until the 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 and they already are making some moves but we have a we have we have their playbook you know you you coached you know you were you were a coach it the the opponent is a lot easier when you know the plays that they're calling <laughs> and i feel like that's that's where we are we have to remind ourselves that we serve a big god that has been here since the beginning of time and will be here after time. And there's nothing that humans have done that God has not been able to stop. So um, this, this is, this is a tool just to use to show us what they're capable of and what they're shooting for, what they're aiming for. And we, it's, it's, it's on us to look, learn and observe and be ready. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Cause that's, that's that, that, that element of surprise is something that they're, that they work with sometimes, and we can't be surprised right now. 
Well, well said, Brother Graham. So tonight I want to thank uh, Brother Graham and Brother Pendleton, uh, who, who's, who's part of, of our panel, uh, to come back and share with us. And again, audience, please, please, please uh, forgive me for not uh, engaging in questions because I know this would be a two-hour show and we just want to do an initial uh, process and we're going to come back and we will answer all of these questions that you have up here, all of the questions you have in my chat box and send in your emails and I will address some of those individually. Or if you want to contact me individually, feel free. All of you guys have my emails and you can uh, be sure to do that. So guys, this has been the Nobody Asked Me Guy Show. We have just been kind of talking a little bit about the grassroots aspect of this uh, project 2025, uh, of this Agenda 47 and 180, because uh, as Brother Graham so eloquently put it, you need to be aware and you know how to deal with the wolf when it's at your door. And believe me, it is certainly at our door. I repeat again, right here in Louisiana, your Governor Landry is put it, putting in all kinds of uh, things that are not humanitarianly friendly. And you guys need to wake up and be aware. You need to go to the polls and vote, not just for the president, but your council persons, your, your senators, all of your representatives, et cetera. They all are a part of the process. So again, we encourage you to vote. And we appreciate you guys for being here tonight. Again, I apologize. I know you have a ton of questions. Just hit me up personally, and we'll certainly talk about these at the next go-around. Guys, this has been the Nobody Asked Me Guy Show. I'm your host, Melvin Casey Lars. We'd like for you, please, to go to the Nobody Asked Me Guy Show on YouTube, like, and subscribe. It does not call your dime. So